Amen. Well, I hope that uh, has encouraged your heart, just singing those songs and uh, sharing together. I want you to take your Bible with me, if you will, tonight, and uh, boy, where do I ask you to begin? Uh, I guess I would have you perhaps turn to Isaiah 55. That's it, Isaiah chapter 55. And uh, I want to turn your attention to verses 8 and 9 in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I want to remind you that one week ago, I shared with you all a message that I called Passover Hope. Of course, Passover is going to end tomorrow night at sundown. That's it? Is that all? Is it over? Nothing changes? There's no lasting impact from it? Nothing more to do with Passover until we celebrate it again next year? I want to talk about post-Passover living as I begin tonight. Let's have a word of prayer first of all. Our Father in Heaven, we are so thankful that we can come before you. To whom shall we go? You're the one that has the words of life and you alone. You're the only one that we have in heaven. You're the only one that we desire on this earth. We pray, Lord, that you will use your word tonight to just open our hearts, soften them, melt them, plant your word deep within them. And then, Lord, cause it to grow. Bring forth life through the life-giving spirit and word of God tonight. Accomplish what you purpose to do. We ask it in the name of and for the glory, the sake of Jesus. Amen. What is post-Passover living? Well, what lasting effect has Passover had on you? Let me ask it this way. What's the purpose of Passover anyway? Is it just a, a, a happy family feast? Is it just uh, remembering the deliverance of the Jewish people annually? Is it just feeling good about gathering around a table and participating in it? That's all okay. But last week I shared a verse Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23, and here's what it says. The first part says, And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in. What is Passover about? Passover has as its purpose, the purpose of the Exodus, was to bring us somewhere. To bring Israel where? To bring Israel to what? God wanted to bring his people to a new place. And God intends Passover truth to be permanent, life-changing. And if it isn't, it's a waste. When I talk about post-Passover living, I'm not only reminded about the purpose of the Exodus, but if you read on in that 23rd verse of Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm also reminded of the place that they were to enter. The remainder of that verse says, To give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. God brought them out of Egypt in order to bring them into, specifically, the land that he sware unto their fathers, that promised land. Did he bring them out of Egypt to bring them to the shores of a deep, impassable sea? Did he bring them out of Egypt in order to just bring them into a howling wilderness lifestyle? Did he bring them out of Egypt so that they would simply endure a dry desert life? No. That was all simply a means to an end. He brought them out in order to bring them into the land that he promised to their forefathers, that he promised 
to the patriarchs of Israel. And pass over truth, if it's properly responded to, will bring us into a new land. It'll bring us into a new life, just as it did them. In other words, the Passover is supposed to make a lasting effect upon your life. It's supposed to make your life totally new if you understand the truth properly. And so, if you had anything at all to do with Passover, did it have that kind of effect upon you? What's your, your post-Passover life like? Well, just as Passover will be finished tomorrow night at sundown, last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, what the world calls Easter. And I would say the same thing. Is that it? It's over. Is that all? Nothing changes? Do we go back then to just living the, the same old way? Is there no lasting impact from celebrating Resurrection Sunday? Is there nothing more to do with the Resurrection Truth until next year? So I want to talk to you the rest of the time that we have tonight on what I call post-resurrection living. Post-resurrection living. You know, often, Jesus' resurrection is only connected in our preaching and teaching to a promised future bodily resurrection. But did you know that it is also meant to be, and it must become a way that you live your current life every day, a resurrection life? When we came to Christ, we were redeemed for heaven. That is, salvation in Jesus will bring you to heaven. In fact, there's no other way to get to heaven. If you have never come into a saving relationship with Jesus, if you have never asked Him and believed upon Him to forgive your sin, if you haven't trusted His sacrifice in your place as your substitute in your behalf, you are not saved. And if you're not saved, you have no home in heaven. Heaven is not yours. You are redeemed by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for heaven. Salvation will bring you to heaven. But, I will say this. God is more interested in just bringing you to heaven. If you're saved, that's guaranteed. But what is not guaranteed is your sa if you are saved is what God wants to do as well. As much as bring you to heaven, God wants to bring heaven to your soul here and now. God wants you to have a heavenly lifestyle right now. God wants you to live a resurrection life. He wants you not only to be redeemed for heaven, He wants you to be rescued from self. He wants you to be rescued from self. I had you turn to Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, because I wanted you to see for yourself what the prophet says here. And he says in those two verses, from God speaking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, God says. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. You don't think the way God thinks, you don't act the way God acts. That's a given. He says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Breaking that all down, God thinks differently than you do. God does things different than the way you do. And I believe that one of the big things that God is always doing in your life, if you're a believer, is He is seeking to get you on the same page with Him. He wants you to think like He thinks. He wants you to, to do what He does. 
He wants you to reflect his thoughts and his acts instead of your own. So post-resurrection living is not only that you are redeemed for heaven, but that you are rescued from self because in ourselves, in our natural selves, we're a mess. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, a person without Jesus is called a natural man. But in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there is a believer who is called a carnal person who is saved but lives like a natural man. He's saved, but he lives like he's not saved. In fact, if you look at those first three verses, he says uh, that I fed you with milk and not with meat. You are spiritually superficial. And he's, he goes on to say in that uh, uh, third verse, you're carnal. You're saved, but you're living on the level of a natural man, of an unsaved man. You're carnal. How is that evident? There's envying among you. You're jealous of one another. And there's strife among you. You're argumentative. There's divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? You have your, you're involved in hero worship. You have your, your favorite preacher or whatever. These are all marks of carnal believers. I think perhaps let's go back. Let's go back to post-resurrection days in the lives of the disciples. Let's see their self-life as it's played out. Well, first of all, before the resurrection, before the crucifixion, the Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 56, that all his disciples fled. They ran for fear when Jesus was arrested in that Garden of Gethsemane. And then the next picture that we have of them in John chapter 20 and verse 19 is that they are all holed up in a locked room and they're fearful. It says they fear what might happen to them. I want to tell you that that is the natural condition of human beings. And that is a carnal level in many Christian lives, full of fear. That really boils down to self-protection and self-preservation. Now those are natural things in a human being's life. But that does not make us to live on a resurrection life plane. And that has to be dealt with. In that same 1 Corinthians chapter 2 passage, and in the 15th and the 16th verse, here's the contrast with a natural man. The unsaved man, he's this way, but the, 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 the saved man, the spiritual man, here's his characteristics. In verse 15, he is discerning. He discerns things. And in verse 16, he has the mind of Christ. While it's true that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways, it's also true according to the 16th verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that believers are connected with God's mind. We have the mind of Christ, it tells us. And as a result of that, God's thoughts can be our thoughts. God's ways can be our ways. The way God thinks is then the way God acts. If we have the mind of Christ, if we have God's thoughts, we can have God's acts as well. They follow. In other words, if you have the mind of Christ, then your life is going to mirror God's thoughts and God's ways, which remember, Isaiah says, is totally the opposite of the way we think or what we would do. What I'm saying is, a spiritual believer who lives on that post-resurrection 
level. Post-resurrection living is what I'm calling it. That kind of living is counterintuitive to natural thinking. It's counterintuitive thinking and acting. And includes dozens of paradoxes that we find in the Bible. And I don't have the time to go through many of them, but I'm just going to quickly, and I can't go into detail for time's sake, but I'm going to quickly just go down through maybe a dozen paradoxes that is exactly the way that God thinks. That's the opposite of the, the, the way we think. Here's the first one. God says that loss is gain. To lose is actually to gain. You remember Matthew 16? He tells his disciples he's going to the cross. Peter says, no, no, this isn't going to happen. No, God, forbid that to happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking like God thinks. You're thinking like man thinks. And then he says to him, you need to learn to lose your life instead of protecting it. You need to take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, because if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. So in God's economy, the way God thinks, the way God acts, loss is gain. He told that rich young ruler, go sell all of your wealth, all of your goods, all your possessions, and give it to the poor. Gain, uh, loss is gain. Paul said, everything I had going for me as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he said, everything I had going for me, I counted it all at loss that I might win Christ. Loss is gain. Second way that God thinks and acts that's so totally opposite of ours, dying is living. Dying is living. He said, uh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Dying is, you die to live. You deny yourself, you die to self in order to have the power of the resurrection life of Christ in you, through you. And then, here's another one. The least among us is the greatest. In Matthew chapter 20, the disciples are arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus turns all of that on its head. And he says, you know who's going to be the greatest? The one who's the least is going to be the greatest. You are great by becoming small. And then here's another one. In that same passage... He uses the illustration of authority. And he tells us that those that are the servants, they're the leaders. They're the ones with authority. I don't have time to turn to these passages, but I'm thinking about Matthew chapter 20, verse 27 and 28. It's not about power grabbing. It's not about uh, enforcing your authority, he tells his disciples. But power and authority is found in deferring to others, is what he's teaching them. And you win followers by being a servant as you lead. And you lead by love. Here's another one. Humbling is exalting. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due season he'll lift you up. He'll exalt you. He says, blessed are you when you're persecuted. When you humble yourself, you're exalted. When you're persecuted, you're blessed. When you become a fool for my sake, you're actually wise in my eyes. So humbling is actually exalting. Here's another one. The last shall be first. Matthew 19, 30. He's telling his disciples, Peter in particular, who says, hey, we've forsaken all. What are we going to get out of it? That's a typical natural thinking. And Jesus said, oh, 
Well, what you need to understand is that uh, the last are going to be first. In other words, if you sacrifice now, you're going to have everything in eternity. It's a good deal. Here's another way in which God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Hate is actually love. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, he said, Except you hate father, mother, son, and daughter more than me, you can't, uh, uh, except you hate them, you can't be my disciple. Meaning that in order to be a true follower of the Lord, there can be no, no rivals. You must love him supremely. And so to hate is to love. Get it? And then weakness is actually strength. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 9 and 10, Paul is talking about the infirmity that he has in his flesh, that thorn in the flesh that he wanted so badly to be relieved of. But then God says, no, because through your weakness, I can then reveal my strength. And so weakness is strength. There's victory, Paul says, in welcoming infirmity. I glory in my infirmities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So weakness is strength. Another one is giving is getting. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, we are told that when we give, we get heaps in return. More blessed to give than to receive, Paul says. Giving is getting. We don't give to get, but when you give, you get. Another one, slavery is freedom. In Romans chapter 6 and uh, the 18th verse, he's talking about the fact that we have been freed from slavery to sin. And he says, being then made free from sin, ye became the slaves of righteousness. And so slavery is actually freedom. We get a new master. And that new master, when we take his yoke upon us, we actually find that his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and we rest under his yoke. So, slavery is freedom. And then, here's another one. The unseen is seeing. The unseen is seeing. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18 says we should not be looking at things that are seen because they're temporal. We should rather be focused on things that are not seen because they're eternal. The eternal replaces the temporal. So the unseen is actually seeing. And then this final one I'll share tonight. Yielding is actually to be a conqueror. It's to conquer. That we win through defeat. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You yield to God and you have victory. You conquer. You conquer the devil. You conquer that sin within you. You conquer this world. It's through submission. Yielding is conquering. So, Listen very closely as we close here. This is why the Christian life is just totally impossible. It's impossible for you to live and for me to live in your own power. It's impossible to do that. We need God's wisdom. We need God's strength. We need God's grace. To put it simply, we need God, all God's infinite ability in all of our inability. I read of a wealthy Christian man who was led by the Lord to send anonymously a large sum of money to a poor brother in Christ. But he didn't want to send it all in one big sum. So he decided to send it in increments. And when he sent the first uh, uh, sum, he added a, a note at the bottom of his little letter. And he said simply, more to follow. 
And when he sent uh, uh, regular uh, increments of dollars to his friend, he always put that on the bottom, more to follow. Well, can I say this? You know what post-resurrection living is? It's all about more to follow. God forgives us, and there's more forgiveness to follow. God gives us wisdom, there's more wisdom to follow. We depend upon God for peace at a time like this, there's more peace to follow. We're in a, in a particular temptation, there's more grace to deliver. We need purity, there's more purity to follow. We need strength, there's more strength to follow. We need provision, there's more provision to follow. There's more to follow, and it goes throughout eternity. When you get to heaven, there's more to follow. Never ends. These spiritual truths involve choices that you and I must make every moment. And it really comes down to this. Will you trust God enough to surrender each moment? and take his grace, and take his ability for, what it, for whatever it is you need, post-resurrection living. Don't let past Sunday and the wonderful truth that God gave to our hearts from his word go to the wind. Post-Passover living, post-resurrection living. It's got to have lasting impact or it's a waste. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, I do ask that you might just use these truths in the way that you see fit. Pray that people will respond to them and that it will result in real resurrection living. It will be evident in our dealings with each other in our daily life, in Jesus' name.